Our guest today is the author of numerous personal finance books, including From Here to Financial Happiness, How to Think About Money, and the 2023 book, My Money Journey. He is the former personal finance columnist for the Wall Street Journal, where he spent 20 years, and the current editor of the website, HumbleDollar.com. Welcome, Jonathan. Dan, it's great to be with you and Scott. Thanks so much for having me on. We are huge fans. This is an honor for us. Okay, Jonathan, I want to pick up on the theme of your most recent book, My Money Journey, and ask a little about your personal journey. Can you tell us about growing up in England? Well, I grew up only partly in England. When I was three years old, my parents moved from London to Washington, D.C. My father, up until that point, had been a financial journalist himself, but he moved to D.C. in order to join the World Bank, and that's where he spent the, the next 20 years of his career. Uh, seven years into that, just before my 10th birthday, he got posted to Bangladesh, uh, where I couldn't go to school. So I got packed off to boarding school in England and proceeded to uh, be incarcerated there for the next nine years. <laughs> uh, from there, uh, I attended university in England, worked in London for a year as a junior reporter and discovered how pitifully junior reporters are paid in England. And at that point, I decided that, you know, at least, you know, if I was going to be poor, I'd at least be poor close to my family. So I moved back to the States and I've been here ever since. At this point, uh, you know, 30, is it, is it 37 years? It couldn't really be that long. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been here since then, um, initially with Forbes magazine, then with the Wall Street Journal. And for the past decade, I've pretty much been doing my own thing, including uh, running the website that you mentioned, humbledollar.com. Wow. I want to still ask a couple more questions about England because I lived in England for three years when I was a kid from age nine to 12. And Scott, I can see why he's called his website Humble Dollar because he's being he's being very humble. He didn't just go to any university uh, in England. What university did you go to, Jonathan? I went to Cambridge University, which is the greatest university in the world. And I, I say that not because I went there, but because it. I can't imagine having a better university experience. I mean, it's one of the most gorgeous places in the world. Uh, the only downside of a British university education is it only takes three years. You get you graduate after three years. And then just sort of if you go to Oxford or Cambridge, three years later, you automatically get upgraded to an MA upon the payment of five quid. So you know, I sheepishly paid my five quid and <laughs> I got my MA. I have the certificate somewhere in the basement, but I never actually use it. But yes, well, that Scott, is the privilege of going to Oxford and Cambridge. So, Jonathan, we lived in Bedford and Bedford's not far from um, Cambridge. And so whenever people visited, that was something we always did was was take them there. So the fact that your dad, it sounds like, was a financial journalist, um, you have always been interested in this topic, would you say, or did it come to you later? Money's always been an interest of mine. I mean, when I went to Cambridge, I went there to study economics. I'd studied economics prior to that. Um, I think there was something about the topic that has always appealed to me. Certainly money was a big subject of conversation growing up. Uh, one of the uh, things that I've mentioned to a lot of people is that I grew up with this great family story. Well, <laughs> great in quotation marks. My great, great grandfather, when he died in 1888, was one of the richest men in Britain. And that's wow. what the, the obit said in the newspaper. Um, the, uh, the family fortune that he and his brother amassed was, I regret to say, built on cigarettes. They had a cigarette brand called Cope Cigarettes. Um, they were based out of Liverpool. And all of that wealth on my great-great-grandfather's side went to his sole daughter and his second wife. By the time the money got to my grandfather's generation, it had been somewhat reduced, and my grandfather and his four siblings proceeded to spend much of the money on wine, women, and song. So no money went to, made it to my parents' generation, and that is what happened to the great family fortune. And so I grew up hearing that story, hearing about how this vast fortune had been dissipated, and the message 
to me and to my siblings was you've got to be careful with money. And so certainly, you know, from from the get go, I knew that you had to be frugal, you had to be careful, and certainly you didn't want to engage in wanton spending like my uh, grandfather's generation did. Wow, what a story. Well, that kind of tracks with what Morgan Housel talks about when he, in his book, he he recites the story of the Vanderbilts and talks about how generational wealth is often evaporated soon after. Well, I think one of the things that, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, if you if people grow up with no not, without having to worry about money, it makes them careless with money. But even if people are careful with money, it's hugely difficult to keep family fortunes together for for this one reason. Uh, you think about the standard of living um, in this country or anywhere. It doesn't rise with inflation. It rises with per capita GDP, which increases a couple of percentage points a year faster than inflation. So inflation is 3%, per capita GDP might grow at 5 And this is why if with retirees towards the end of their life, they often feel financially pinched, even if they're keeping up with inflation, because while they're keeping up with inflation, they're not keeping up with the general standard of living. So go back to these great family fortunes. In order to sustain those great family fortunes, not only do they need for the income that gets paid out to the beneficiaries of that fortune to keep up with per capita GDP, i.e. faster than inflation by a couple of percentage points, but they then also need to reinvest part of the gains in order to keep the portfolio growing so they can continue to pay out at that level. And it is hugely difficult after investment costs to earn those sorts of returns. So family for fortunes are almost destined to self-destruct. Wow. Which actually, I would say, is not a terrible thing. We don't want to have you know, families enjoying perpetual wealth in this country. I agree. And I feel like there's a lot of families in this country trying to buck that trend and in, in, ensure generational wealth. I want to pivot a little bit to working at the Wall Street Journal. What, what, what was that like? And did you have favorite topics? So I went to the Wall Street Journal at the uh, tender young age of 27. And astonishingly, you know, three and a half years later, you know, which point I was 31, um, I was given my own column, <laughs> uh, which, you know, probably re reflected a lapse of judgment on the editor's point. <laughs> but uh, the fact is, I was given my own column um, at age 31, and I started to write about personal finance. And I wrote that column for the rest of my time at the journal. And what I wrote about changed over time. And partly, you know, you'll understand this, you know, doing a podcast, you know, the first few podcasts are really easy. You know, you do the obvious topics. And then after a while, you scratch your head and say, well, what the heck am I going to talk about this week? And so I started scratching around, you know, I read a lot of academic literature and so on. And I became interested in personal finance beyond sort of the rudiments of building your basic portfolio, you know, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and so on. And so topics that became of interest to me are things like, you know, money and happiness and what it takes to have a fulfilling life. I mean, these days with the website, humbledollar.com, you know, in many ways I've continued that theme. I'm very interested in what what it takes to have a good retirement. And because it's it's a lot more than just money, you know, to have a good retirement, you need to think about issues like being in good health, like having a robust network of friends or family, trying to arrange your life so that you have a sense of purpose to your days. Well, this is one of the reasons we're such big fans of Humble Dollar. And Scott, um, which I'm going to turn it over to him in a moment here, he's going to get more into to that website. You mentioned starting at a young age at the Wall Street Journal, and I am a big fan of the head cut shots that Wall Street Journal has. And I love yours, Jonathan. Um, uh, do you have that um, anywhere in your house? Do you keep that? Do they give you like a portrait of that? Or is it just something that accompanied your column? Um, I actually think I, somewhere down in the basement, I do have the original head cut. Um, they did give it to me. Um, and I, and somewhere on my website, I do actually have the head cut and I do, I, I like it cause I look very, very young. I certainly do not look that young anymore. I, uh, for my sins, 
left the journal for six years and went to what my friends called the dark side. I spent six years working on Wall Street. I was at Citigroup as director of financial education for their U.S. wealth management business. And after I got sick and tired of earning an absurd amount of money, I quit and uh, I did go back to the journal for 15 months, at which point they made me a new head cut, uh, which reflected my... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> how I appeared at that point. And it was not nearly as appealing, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to turn over to this guy here one sec. A, a joke I made to a, a Wall Street Journal reporter. She was covering the 403B and was interviewing us. And I jokingly asked if we would get a head cut. Um, and she said, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when I was at the Journal, you know, when there was breaking news, and this was before the Journal ran photographs, if it, there was somebody who they were going to do a head cut off, you know, they had to get it done in a hurry. And, you know, there were a group of people in the journal graphics department who made those head cuts. I mean, it was done by hand at the time. And I, whenever I took people on tours um, of the journal, I would always take them past what I call the dot squad, the, the, this group <laughs> of uh, graphic artists who created those head cuts. And in a pinch, if they, you know, their back was against the wall, they could produce one of those in about two hours. So it was not really made for the internet world of breaking news, you know, instantaneous (laughs) information. Uh, But it was, it was a cool feature of the journal. And, you know, well, I understand why they run pictures today. It, uh, it was fun when it was a no photograph newspaper. Dan, maybe we could upload photographs of uh, us to the uh, chat GPT and ask it to make a dot, uh, make one for us of the Wall Street Journal style. (laughs) I wonder if that would work. So Jonathan, uh, it took me seven years to earn my MA um, and considerably more than five quid. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, that's pretty funny. So I've been uh, reading, admiring, and enjoying your work for thirty over 30 years. I guess almost nearly 30 years because I was in uh, college when I started reading your uh, column in the Wall Street Journal. I would go to the library every day back when we had actual newspapers. Um, cause I couldn't obviously afford my own subscription to the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> and, but that was the, that was the first column I would always read would be, uh, would be the personal finance column. And between you and we had a guest on last week, Liz Weston, um, very influential in shifting my finance degree to working in personal finance. Uh, and I continued to read. I've continued to read you ever since. And so I can't tell you how humbled we are actually to have you on, on the pod. So thanks you. Thank you for coming on. And so why did you start humble dollar? What was the, what was the uh, reasoning behind that? It, it was, uh, it, it has turned out to be something that I did not plan. So when I left Citigroup in 2014, I went back to the journal on a sort of part-time basis. I also wanted to have something else to do. And at the time I was, you know, fascinated by, you know, the world of sort of instant publishing, what you could do through Amazon with its create space and, you know, instantaneous paperbacks and also with Kindle and how you could, for instance, create a Kindle book where you embedded hyperlinks so that people could go onto the web and find additional information. So I had this notion that I was going to do this annual money guide. And I spent my initial months when I left Citigroup writing that money guide. I published it uh, at the end of 2014 and again at the end of 2015. And it worked as I expected, you know, uh, right down, you know, on December 31st, I would be there down to the wire, you know, adding in the latest, you know, market statistics, government stats, whatever it was press the button and the next day it would be available. It was very, very cool. But the problem was by January 2nd, it was out of date. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I decided, uh, well, maybe this isn't, you know, this isn't worth all the time and effort and I should just throw it on the web and I'll make it freely available and I'll run some ads against it. And so that was sort of the notion of humble dollar. I was just going to make this financial guide available for free. And along the way I thought, well, maybe I'll, you know, I'll blog once a week or so. I was already doing that on a, another site I had. And maybe I'll ask some friends whether they want to blog as well. And so that was how Humble Dollar came to be in 
at the end of 2016. Um, the reason I settled on the name, people always find this interesting, is I didn't want the site to be all about me. So I own JonathanClements.com, but I didn't want to use that URL. So I spent months, you know, using GoDaddy, trying to come up with a clever URL. And, you know, if it if it's bad now, trying to find a clever URL, it was equally bad then. I mean, all the obvious ones are taken. And somewhere in the middle of the night, you know, I sort of woke up and I'd been mulling these words like humble and so on. And I climbed out of bed, went to GoDaddy, put in humbledollar.com. And sure enough, it was available. And so that became the name of the site. Uh, I launched it right at year end 2016. And since then, it's taken on a life of its own. You know, I've gone from, you know, running maybe three articles a week to today. We put up a dozen pieces of copy every week. You know, the amount of traffic is probably running at about five times the level it was in 2017. And it's also morphed. I mean, initially it was sort of a general personal finance site. I didn't really have any strong idea about what exactly it would be other than, you know, being interested in not only indexing, but also the softer side of money. But now driven by the audience has become much more about about a site geared towards those near retirement and in retirement. I mean, it still focuses on, you know, issues like indexing, issues like the softer side of money, money and happiness, what makes fulfilling life and so on. Uh, but the site as it exists today is not what I imagined it would be back in 2016 when I first started to upload copy for the, the launch of the site. Well, we've watched the evolution of Humble Dollar, and I mean, I I love it. I think this is uh, I, I like how it's evolved. And one of the things I love about Humble Dollar is the breadth of writers that you showcase. Um, and I was I was taking a look at it, and it looks like you have at least forty two different writers that have contributed at least five pieces. Uh, when what are you looking for in a submission piece um, that you can like, what is it that kind of sparks your interest that says, yeah, okay, I'm going to accept this piece and put it on my blog? Well, you, you, I like the way you sort of frame it. Like I'm sitting here and picking and choosing among the copy that gets <laughs> sent to me. <laughs> Endless submissions. Oh, no, I couldn't possibly take that. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> My good man, I'll let you onto the site. That's not the way it works, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, I I don't want to say I, I run everything that I get, but you know, most people have at least a couple of good stories in them, and you know, if I with some editing, they normally can be made to work. But um, you know, what do I what do I look for? Well. What I say to writers is you may not be an expert on the financial world and in, you know, in almost all cases, you know, they are not financial planners by training, you know, they're not involved with Wall Street. These are just, you know, you know, Joe and Jane Amateur who happen to have a keen interest in personal finance. And so I say, well, you may not be a financial expert, you are an expert on your own life. So if you're going to write for the site, if you want to do so with authority, you need to write about financial experiences that you have had. And so that has also become sort of part of the site that when people write about finance, they're generally writing about something that they have experienced. And that helps to bring, you know, the, the subject to life because people are talking about what they actually did, how it felt, the mistakes they made and so on. And that's you know, become a key aspect of the site. Well, that's one of the things I love about it because it's not written, it's not always written by professionals or professional uh, personal finance writers, or I mean, these is like regular people who are sharing their experiences, good and bad, and experiences that are so different than, I mean, I see every day. And I think it helps give a perspective of what retirement can look like, what pre-retirement can look like, and how it's, it really is very much personable. Mm -hmm. uh, or personal it's it's not personal finance it the, that word is a big word in that in that topic personal finance it is so individualized and i don't think 
I don't think a lot of people see it that way. I think it's okay. Everybody has to do the X, Y, and Z in order to be, I don't know, happy or successful or whatever. And no, that's not the way it is. The things that make me happy are not the things that make you happy. The amount of money that I need or not, is not the amount of money that you need. And I think that really comes through with the pieces that we see posted on your site. All those perspectives is really helpful to me. And I'm a financial planner. I do this for a living. Uh, and it, it, it opens up kind of a new world of, of thinking. So, and, and I honestly did think that you had so many pieces coming in every single day that uh, you had to you know, pick and choose, but. <laughs> I mean, I, I, so I don't want to say that, I don't want to imply that I will take anything, but uh, you know, I know, <laughs> dear God, I have some standards. <laughs> 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 that's that's uh, why Dan Otter's never published on your site. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, I do. Uh, you know, I think people look at what's written, and and in some sense, they they get the gist of it. You know, if you're if you're coming to boast about your financial life, or you're not willing to be honest about what's going on with you, you know, you're not going to submit to Humble Dollar. Um, and to the extent that people appear to be bragging, you know, they'll get roughed up in the comments section. You know, <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I'm most proud about when it comes to the site is that we actually have a very civil community. I mean, you know, people do not regularly get trashed in the comments section. If people disagree, they tend to do so politely. Um, every so often it does get out of control, but I really try to rein it in. Uh, you know, I have made it clear that politics is verboten. I don't want any political debates on the site. I mean, it is a financial site. I did it with the contributions. Occasionally, people try to sneak political views into their articles, and I just cut it right out. You are the final editor on, on the site, after all. It is a benign dictatorship. <laughs> uh, not a benevolent one. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, so last Monday, uh, well, the, the, not this current Monday, but the previous Monday, I was reading the blog and I came across uh, your piece. Um, you're not always the author, obviously, but I came across your The Money Pit piece and I immediately sent it over to Dan and, and texted him. This is a great piece and one that I think resonates with people. Um, it, it resonated with me, I think. It, and I think it's actually resonating with people for different reasons because Dan and I had a little different takes on it, I think. And so I wanted to read just a very short excerpt from that post and then get your uh, comment on it. So the very first paragraph from The Money Pit. Calculating the return from home ownership typically involves some mix of delusion and dubious math. And that's never truer than when it comes to remodeling projects. Oh, that's so true. On the numbers alone, it's all but impossible to justify a major renovation. Trust me, I've tried. Can you tell our audience a little more about that article and why you wrote it? So last year, we renovated um, a significant portion of our house, mostly the kitchen, but also some of the upstairs. And as with, you know, so many remodeling projects, you know, it started with this sort of, you know, little thing like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we had a little bit more light in the kitchen? <laughs> and the next thing you know, you know, we've got our architectural plans, you know, we end up getting the kitchen completely gutted. We also had the back of the house upstairs uh, uh, rebuilt. We had the exterior um, redone at the back of the house. We had to move out of the house for five months for all of this to happen. I mean, we live in a small Philadelphia row home. So, you know, if we had lived here through the remodeling, uh, we probably would not be together anymore. Um, <laughs> in fact, we would probably both be institutionalized. Uh, so, and it was, I'm not even going to admit what it cost, but the, the cost was into six figures comfortably. And even as we did it, I know that I will never recoup that money. I mean, I can try to, you know, run the math in such a way that it feels less bad. But the truth is, you know, probably half of the money I spent has gone out the window and will not be coming back. <laughs> That's actually 
what I loved about your story is how honest you are about that um, and why that's okay. You said you'd be lucky to recoup half of what you spent on the remodel, which on the surface sort of makes the dollars you spent not sound, well, sounds less than frugal. And I think we get stuck on this term frugal, but measuring a return on your investment isn't just about dollars. Um, and this is what I think, one of the things I also love about your site um, and, and the blog is you're not just measuring, and I don't think you're just measuring the return on this by the dollars that it could potentially bring you or lose you in the short term. How else in non-monetary figures has the remodel paid off for you and your spouse? So, Scott, let me just back up a, a minute because people sort of talk about, you know, not just remodeling projects, but real estate generally. And they, you know, boast endlessly about how much they've made on their home. And that is not as bad as the remodeling conversation, but in general, you know, it is completely delusional and the math is usually horrifically bad. And when I talk to people about real estate generally, I say, well, you need, you need to take your return from real estate and break it down into two components. There is the price appreciation and there is what we might think of as the dividend. And the price appreciation, if you look historically, home prices in the U.S. have appreciated a little bit more than one percentage point a year faster than inflation one percentage point a year faster than inflation. Now, remember, when people talk about stocks, they talk about seven percentage points a year faster than inflation. So, you know, one percentage points a year faster than inflation doesn't sound so great. On top of that, you know, people always forget all the costs that are involved. You know, you do need to maintain the place. You do need to pay property taxes on the place. You do need to insure the place. And we haven't even got into all the funny math that goes on around mortgages and leverage and the cost of that interest and so on. But fundamentally, once you look at price appreciation on a home relative to inflation and you factor in all the costs, you know, this turkey is losing you money after inflation. That is the reality of the price appreciation. But then, but then there's this dividend part because all investments have price plus dividend. Now, the dividend on a house, if you're a landlord, is the rent that you collect. And that rent, if you are a landlord, could be a substantial. You know, again, you know, with the price appreciation, you might get inflation subtracted a little bit for cost. But the rent, the rent might be equal to buying a stock that has a 7% dividend yield, right? It's, it's, it's great if you're a landlord. It's a lot of work involved, but it's a great dividend yield. But what if you live in the place yourself? It's still generating that dividend yield, except you as the owner is immediately consuming it. So the biggest part of the return from home ownership is the fact that you get to live in this place. But the fact that you get to live in a place means that the biggest part of the return is immediately consumed by you. It doesn't mean it's not valuable, but it's not a return of the cash variety. <laughs> it's right. not putting dollars in your bank account. And it's sort of the same thing with remodeling, but even worse. With a remodeling project, there is a, you know, there's a price gain or price some you know or price loss and there is a dividend yield and the price loss is significant and it's almost an instantaneous 50 percent loss on your money but the dividend hopefully will be huge and if it's not huge you shouldn't have done the project in the first place uh, but the dividend or remodeling project is the pleasure you get from the, the renovation that you did and so has the dividend been, has the dividend paid off for you so far? Are you happy with it? Is the project paying you dividends in the happiness that you anticipated? Yes, with an asterisk. So I am actually sitting in the new kitchen now, and there is indeed a lot more light coming in. We basically blew out the back of the house and put in these huge windows. And so I can sit here where I'm sitting here recording this podcast with you. And if I look to the right, I can see our little postage stamp city backyard. Um, there's a bird feeder there, which is 
chaotic all day long with squirrels and birds fighting to get seed out of the uh, <laughs> the bird feeder. It's just really actually it's very entertaining. Um, you know, I can see the bulbs are starting to come up now that you know spring is approaching and we have global warming. In fact, the way things are going, they'll probably be blooming before the end of February. Um, so all of that is great, but the there is an asterisk. And the asterisk is this: when we moved back in. Every time I walked down into the kitchen, I stopped, I looked around, and I said, this is a fabulous addition to our house. I mean, look at this great kitchen. The work was superb. You know, all the stuff that we picked out, really happy. And now, and, you know, this is, you know, hedonic adaptation at work. I walk into the kitchen, and it's like, oh, yeah, hey, that's right. This is our new kitchen. <laughs> this, is, this is what a six-figure sum looks like. <laughs> Um, but there is this risk that you, you, you stop noticing. Does your spouse feel differently? No, Elaine feels, uh, does feel the same. I mean, we, we still do talk about it um, and about how, what nice work the contractor did and the quality of the cabinets and, you know, the choices that we made and so on. But it's, it's definitely uh, doesn't have as big a return per day as it did in the initial weeks. Got it. Interesting. What, so the other I mean, way. This, so, so, just, so Scott, before you, so this is, you know, this is true of anything. You buy, you know, a new car and, in, you know, in the initial weeks, you are thrilled with the new car, but within a year, it's just a way to get around town. Yeah. And that is true of almost anything that we purchase to get added happiness out of those dollars that you spend, what you need to do is to step back periodically and think about these good things in your life and say, oh yeah, we had this really great kitchen remodeling done. We bought this really fabulous car and aren't we lucky to have it? Because those sorts of acts of gratitude can indeed allow us to get greater happiness out of the dollars that we've spent. That's great. I, I love how you put that. Um, and it's funny because like I looked at this piece in, in sort of that way. Like here is Jonathan saying, listen, uh, <laughs> we're not going to get a lot of money out of this, but there are other benefits. Um, and and you know, the money is there for, you know, to create, hopefully also to create happiness and joy and, and experiences. Um, but I think Dan all looked at it slightly different than I did. And this is what I love about personal finance. It's it, people look at it and get different things out of it. And it, you know, his first question is like, why should, why is anybody buying anymore? Why don't we just rent? And obviously it's a little different today because home prices are just outrageously expensive. Although rents are really bad too, but I'm interested, really Dan is interested, but I want to know too, what is your perspective on home ownership versus renting and could you ever see yourself renting? So I think for, for me, it really just comes down to a time horizon issue. I mean, if, if you are going to only stay put for, you know, seven years or less, or maybe five years or less, I think you should rent. Because once you look at the round trip cost of um, buying and then selling, you know, real estate really doesn't make sense if you have anything less than a five-year time horizon and probably seven is 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 a better gauge particularly now given how lofty home prices are um but yeah if i um if i thought that i was only going to be in a place for a for a couple of years i would definitely rent um, a more interesting question at least sorry dan <laughs> i think a more interesting <laughs> question um is it when you go to buy you know, I've, you know, generally been in the camp where, you know, because I'm cheap, I always look for, you know, less expensive homes and so on. And, and the result is that you tend to end up with places that have not been fixed up. And then after a few years, you get dissatisfied and then you end up blowing, you know, a six figure sum like I just did. Um, so I think a better strategy when it comes to buying a house is actually to hunt for the house that somebody else has renovated and you can then buy their renovations at a discount. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually set out to do that when I moved to Philadelphia uh, three and a half years ago, 
but I simply, well, at the time, you know, the, uh, the real estate market in Philadelphia, as it was in the rest of the country, was, you know, was just, was, it was on crack. I mean, it was just crazy. I lost out, I think, on five bidding wars because wow. I was too cheap to, you know, to go off <laughs> over the asking price. Um, but I do think a better strategy is to find the house that you really want that's been fixed up to your liking and then buy that rather than go the route that I did, which was to buy a somewhat run down place and then fix it up. Your Interesting. That's uh, I, actually, that's really good advice. And I know, you know, we're looking, I mean, we're not going to move for probably another five or seven years till my wife retires, but uh, yeah, that's the, you know, that's the question. Do we buy a place, fix it up? Do we build a place? Do we, um, or do what you're talking about? Yours, your idea sounds like the best one. Um, but so I know we don't have much more time, so we do got a couple more questions I want to ask you. What do you think are the most interesting personal finance topics today? What are the most interesting personal finance topics today? I think, you know, the whole issue of generating retirement income is is a fascinating topic and sort of to come back to you know what you were saying earlier scott you know this is where the personal and personal finance really comes out because people come at this question from all points of view and i'm not i'm, I'm i have no interest in fact i have negative interest in talking about the four percent withdrawal rate and whether it's right or not i mean i just that i'm so tired of that question that you know if somebody if somebody asks me again, I'll you know I just gotta scream. But let, let me delete think... my next question. Hold on a second. <laughs> <I'm> a... <laughs> but I do think that this issue of you know how you go about generating retirement income, you know, really goes to the core of how people think not only about money but all, also about their life. So you know they're basically sort of two strategies. One, you could just hang on to all the money you you have and you know, play the financial markets and try to squeeze out income that way. Or you can go out and try to ensure that you have some sort of predictable income to take you through the rest of your life. And that might mean, you know, delaying Social Security until age 70. It might mean going out and buying uh, some uh, income annuities. And people, when you bring these topics up, I mean, you know, there's a sort of fundamental sort of difference. Some people are like, no way am I ever going to bet on that I'm going to live a long life. No way am I going to delay Social Security. I might go, you know, might keel over tomorrow, buy an income annuity, not a chance. And then, you know, there are other people like, yeah, you know, I think I want the reassurance that comes with having steady income for the rest of my life. And that's why I'm going to delay Social Security. And it's why I'm you're going to consider buying some income annuities. People are all over the map on this one. And it, you know, I've had the debate often enough that I know it has nothing to do with logic and everything to do with people's feelings about yeah. money. 100%. Um, I get that a lot of questions like that, you know, like, should I pay off my home or invest the money? I don't know. That's not a, it's, that's not, I mean, do you want the, the answer that gets you the most likely dollars? Or do you want the answer that makes you, that gives you the ability to sleep at night? It, it's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I like that. Uh, do you ever plan to fully retire or is this something, do you see yourself always be involved in some way with personal finance education and advocacy? My view on this has actually shifted over time. If, when I first started learning about personal finance in the 20, in my 20s, um, I had sort of cooked up this notion, I mean, you know, and, and take it for what it is, which is reflecting the naivete of somebody who was in their 20s. But, you know, I read about investing, how, you know, stocks earn seven percentage points a year more than inflation. So I had this notion that, OK, what I'm going to do is by the time I'm 40, I'm going to have saved a quarter of a million dollars and then... I'm just going to leave it and it's going to grow at seven percentage points a year for the next 20 years. Then at 60, I'll have a million bucks, which will be enough for retirement. And at 40, having amassed that $250,000, I can then basically go off and, you know, just make enough money to cover the bills for the rest of my life uh, or for the next 20 years and everything will be good. That, that was my simplistic view of you know, retirement planning in my 20s when I first sort of learned about this stuff. 
but implicit in that is this notion that you know doing as little as possible and certainly doing nothing once you get to your 60s is the goal that is the good life and today you know i'm on the completely other end of that spectrum i'm at age 61 you know i'm thinking that i may never retire i think and and i'm going to give you these i'm I'm probably a bit I'm probably being too loquacious as it is, but I'm going to try and give you the, <laughs> the the quickish answer to this. You know, if you say to somebody, you know, what's the big retirement, you know, issue here? And they'll basically say, I want to somehow generate steady income for the rest of my life while still, you know, having a, you know, a sense of purpose to my days. I want to be intellectually stimulated. I want to have, I want to be socially stim- stimulated, have a robust network of friends and family to turn to and so on and so on. And when you think about all the things that make for a good retirement, what you realize is that what it takes to have a good retirement is to have a job. <laughs> If you have a job, you have the social stimulation, you have the intellectual stimulation, you have the steady income, you know, you don't have to worry about running out of money. And so I'm actually um, starting on this kick where I want to push a new notion, you know, up until now, like this conversation has been dominated by the fire movement, financial independence, retire early, save a lot of money, quit the workforce as soon as you can. Well, I think that we should replace the fire movement with the ice movement. And the ice movement stands for, I'll continue earning. If you continue earning, you know, you will solve all of your retirement problems. I mean, we need to get beyond this stupid notion or really two stupid notions that one, if you're earning any money in retirement, you're not really retired. And two, that the good life consists of... sitting on your ass all day on the couch, eating cheese doodles and binge watching Netflix. That is not a good retirement. A good retirement is having something you look forward to every day that makes you a productive person in society. And if it happens to come with the paycheck, that's all the better. Dan, I think that uh, that's that's what Dan and I wanted for the next 20, 30 years, just running 403B wise sounds like a fantastic uh, retirement job. Well, our, Scott, our, our, mean, our ice job. Scott, that would mean we're very bad at our jobs because the K-12 403B would still be a problem. So our joke, <laughs> our joke, Jonathan, is and we tell Tim this all the time. We want to put ourselves out of business. We want to fix this problem. And unfortunately, it's still a problem. <laughs> True. Speaking of that problem, um, one of our, I'm going to, I got two questions for you. I'm going to hand it back to Dan and then we will let you get on with your day. Um, continuing, continuing your, with your ice. Um, one of our favorite tweets of all time uh, is, is actually from Jonathan Clements. It's from you. And, and I'm not going to share my screen. I'll just read it. But I'm, I'm actually interested if you've changed your mind on this because I haven't. Okay. Here's the tweet. Estimated annual sales of equity indexed annuities if salesmen weren't paid huge commissions. And it's just a dollar sign followed by zero, comma, zero, 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 comma, zero, 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 comma, zero, zero. One of our favorite tweets of all time. Equity indexed annuities are an abomination. I mean, if they did not pay huge commissions to the salesmen involved, they would not be sold. I mean, if they are so awful that, you know, if they didn't have the 10, I've seen commissions on these things as high as 17%. Yeah. If they didn't offer salesmen that sort of commission, they would not be sold. Um, and in fact, just sort of come back to what we were talking about earlier, and it, you know, the whole term annuity is just a cesspool of mostly horrible investments, but with a few really good things in there, one of which are immediate fixed annuities. Immediate fixed annuities are a great retirement solution for a lot of older Americans. But guess what? The sales of them are tiny. And why are the sales tiny? Well, it's the reason they're a 
one of the reasons they're a great investment product, which is that they pay very little to the salesman involved. And that's why you as a customer should be interested, but it's also why insurance salesmen don't push them. That's got to be the opening to this uh, podcast, Dan. That was great. <laughs> um, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and, and it's not just the commissions, but it's the trips that they qualify for to, you know, places all over the world. The, I mean, it's the, the things that we allow um, when we let people sell just whatever financial product to people uh, without a fiduciary duty, I think, is, is just ridiculous. I mean, we just shouldn't allow it. And, um, and, and that's controversial. It drives me nuts that that's controversial. Uh, okay, so moving on, I could stay on that piece all day, especially in the 403B world where it's a huge problem. But I wanted just to touch on one more piece um, and then hand it back to Dan. I read this great piece yesterday. Yeah, I think it was dropped yesterday. Um, things I've picked up. It's a wonderful piece about how the author spends his time in retirement. Um, we'll link to it in the show notes for our listeners. What's it like having an older brother write for your site? <laughs> well, first of all, um, I have two older brothers, and they, they are Thanks. identical twins. And, uh, so, and I also have a younger sister. So you know, I was the one in the middle. And, you know, if you can imagine growing up with two older brothers who are identical twins, there were a lot of fights that I lost. <laughs> you know, it, my entire upbringing was, you know, was two on one. <laughs> Maybe this is why when I got into my 30s, I became a reasonably good amateur runner, because that was really the best strategy growing <laughs> up. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I have, I, have, uh, I have three siblings. And actually, you know, we're all very different but we're all remarkably close we have a family text thread that comes to life almost every day with people sharing what's going on uh my mother who's almost 85 is is also on that thread and she's also contributing um it's hard to believe you know you know six decades on that we are still as all as close as we are in terms of the piece that my brother wrote that appeared on um on humble dollar um I actually wrote to him. He helped out in the initial year of the site. He wrote some pieces for me then. And I just wrote to Nick and I said, hey, you know, you're now, you know, you know, 10 years or so into retirement. How about talking about what it's been like and what you've learned? And he wrote it for me. And, you know, I did edit it. I tend to, you know, depending on whether, um, you know, the quality of the piece, I sometimes edit pieces heavily. I didn't edit his piece that heavily, but he didn't object to anything that I did to the piece. And, uh, it was it was great to have him on the site. Um, I do think that he probably got more page views than he than an article would normally get because people thought it was me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when they uh, when they read that I you know I used to run a landscaping business, they were probably a little puzzled. But <laughs> <laughs> well, when I got to the end of the piece, for a minute I thought. I don't know if it was at that piece or another piece where he, he says he has a twin brother. I'm like, wait, Jonathan has a twin? <laughs> and then I started to read between the lines that it's your older brother because I'm like, I don't think he's a landscaper because they were both in the same landscaping business, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, next time you talk to him, which I guess will be on your text thread later today, let him know uh, I really enjoyed that piece. And for our listeners, I'm going to hand it back to Dan, but before I do, before, for our listeners, how can they support Humble Dollar? Because you do not, uh, you do advertising, but you don't do affiliate links. Um, you don't do any of that stuff. So how can our listeners support Humble Dollar? You know, I would say to listeners, you know, more than anything, just, you know, I'd encourage you to come to the site, enjoy the articles that are there, sign up for our twice weekly newsletter. Everything is freely available. I've resisted having a subscription model. Um, you should know that, you know, there is nothing on the site that is there to sort of prick you into, uh, you know, buying financial products or anything. We do not do sponsored links. We do not do sponsored contact content we do not do affiliate marketing links those are the sort of the the trifecta of blogging sins that i've avoided at all costs the site is supported only by advertising and by donations from readers um, if you can donate that's great but if you don't want to donate 
just come to the site. Uh, in the end, as a writer and as an editor, and this is also true for everybody else who you know helps out with the site, you know, it's not about making money. It's about getting people to read our stuff. So it's not supported by you selling equity indexed annuities. <laughs> no, but you know what? You make an appealing case, Scott. <laughs> That's, nobody's ever said that to me before. So, <laughs> All right, Dan. <laughs> Jonathan, you've been so generous with your time. Is there anything else you would like to add? Uh, I think we pretty much run through this. I would just, I'll just finish with my last little spiel, which uh, I often talk about, which is for anybody who's listening to this and, you know, they want a happier financial life. I would just say that there are three key elements. One, you know, you want a sense of financial security. You want, you know, a little bit of money in the bank and know that you're taking care of your longer term goals. Two, you want a robust network of friends and family. And three, you know, you want to be able to spend your days doing what you love. And I think probably for a lot of people uh, who listen to this podcast and are involved in the world of education, you know, that is one of their great blessings. I mean, they get to do something every day that they are passionate about. My, uh, my daughter is a assistant principal in a school here in Philadelphia. And, you know, it's, you know, it's tough work. I mean, I hear about dealing with parents, dealing with children, you know, she certainly doesn't get compensated for the grief that she gets. And yet she does it with a sense of purpose and a sense of passion. And I just have enormous respect for her. So if you have a job where you feel like you're doing good for the world, you know, that is a great thing. And it's probably the reason that you are happier than a lot of your neighbors. Wow. Well, so, so well said, Jonathan, thank you for your time today. Thank you for everything you do. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. It's been fun.